Welcome to our lecture review. Uh, here we're looking at the Guide to Computer Forensics and Investigation, 5th edition. Uh, we're looking at Chapter 12, which focuses on mobile device forensics. Now, do keep in mind that this is just an overview of mobile device forensics, not an in-depth review. So the objectives for this is going to explain basic concepts for mobile device forensics, and we're going to talk about the procedure for acquiring data from these mobile devices. So keep in mind that with cell phones and mobile devices, more and more people are storing more and more information on them. So they're becoming more a treasure trove of data. Things like MMS messaging or SMS messaging, uh, message logs, uh, chat logs, uh, web content, uh, browser history, things like that. Uh, emails that are attached to them. My favorite, pictures and videos that are also on them. Sadly, so many people document more and more of their content from their phones now. So it's like, oh, I'm doing something, regardless of what it is. Let's take a selfie. Let's make a video. And sometimes that phone becomes that treasure trove of that data. So let's assume that your cell phone could get stolen. Uh, or uh, and for other information that could be on your phone that could be stolen. Calendars, dress books, if you have social media. There's a lot of GPS data as well on your phone. Most people don't realize quite how much data is actually stored or processed on their phone. Voicemails eh, may or may not be important. Uh, typically, if we're talking law enforcement, a search warrant is required to gain access to a mobile device. Investigating cell phones and other mobile devices is one or more of the challenges within digital forensics. There is no single standard that exists. So, got to keep that in mind. New phones are always coming out, so there's always new challenges that are coming out with them. And again, there's compatibility issues with that as well. Though mobile phone technology has advanced very rapidly uh, since early 2000s, uh, analog focusing heavily on digital uh, PCS type devices like um, personal assistance, uh, we actually went from third generation or 3G to what we now have uh, 4G and LTE. Basically, faster and faster internet on our mobile devices so that they can slowly start replacing our laptops and things like that. Uh, mobile phone basics, we have to understand kind of how they work. For example, like um, multiplexing, how they actually get signals on the wire. Uh, CDMA, for example, was developed during World War II, and this technology has been patented by Qualcomm after the war. They're one of the first major common digital networks that uses full radio for, uh, frequency spectrum, so better bandwidth. You also have what's called GSM, which is a global system for mobile communication. Another common digital network used by AT&T and T-Mobile within the US. So there are different types of technologies out there. Most code division multiplexing access, CDMA, uh, networks conform to a specific standard, that's the IS-95 standard. These systems are referred to as the CDMA ones. 3D, uh, when we had 3G service, they became CDMA 2000. We also have that uh, GSM, and they use what's called time division multiplexing. Basically, it's the multiple phones that take turns sharing a single channel, which isn't the best bandwidth option, but it, it kind of does work. The 3G standard was developed by the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, where it's compatible with other technologies like CDMA, GSM, and TM TDMA. Also, we have what's called the edge service, and that's going to be bare bone, very limited voice only type digital transmissions. Other 4G technologies, things like our LTE, our MIMO, our ultra mobile broadband, which is still kind of, eh, and our mobile WiMAX. My 
flavor is the main components used for our communication, and they are things like our base transmitter stations, our base tra uh, station controllers, and our mobile switching centers. That's always really interesting because I actually knew several technicians that did mobile switching centers, and it's basically an IP data network that has a, more of a cellular component. They may not be a, a switching IP packets or data frames, but they are switching their version of them. The mobile devices can range from very simple to smart. The smart devices, smartphones, they have everything like a computer would have, memory, processor, long term storage, all of that. They also have what's called the EEPROM. It's programmable read-only memory. Uh, that's typically uh, where certain configurations files are stored. You also have what's uh, ROM, read-only memory. And that's going to be where the operating system is stored because, again, you're going to have to be able to update the operating system and update certain files. So there are, has to be different ways to uh, store things. The important part of that OS is stored in non-volatile memory, so if power loss happens, the operating system is not damaged. Same thing with the cr uh, critical data, photos, videos, all of that stored on long-term storage. So if we're talking about inside our mobile device, we have what's called a PDA, or Personal Digital Assistant, and th they were kind of dated, like th that, that's kind of really old. Uh, a lot of the PDAs had uh, additional long-term storage in the form of some type of SD card, like uh, an actual memory card. More and more mobile devices have both a memory ca uh, card and built-in memory. This kind of depends. That allows us to increase the amount of storage that our device can have. We also have what's called a SIM, or Subscriber Identity Module card, which may or may not still be in all phones. And they are most common in GSM devices. They consist of a microprocessor and internal memory chip. And this basically just re refers to the phone as a mobile station. And it divides that station into two major parts, the SIM card and the mobile equipment. The SIM card has different sizes based on well, manufacturer and all, all of that fun stuff. The SIM card is necessary for the ME to work, meaning without the SIM card, the mobile device is not working. It can be used to be able to be tracked back to a single device. The interesting part here is that mobile devices, uh, they are very sensitive to things like loss of power, but because they have a battery, we can also include things like synchronization to cloud services. For example, iPhones have a way to sync to the cloud. Android phones have a way to sync to the Android cloud. But another concern with this is those same cloud services can be used to wipe uh, those devices. All devices have memory or RAM, just like a process, just like a computer would have memory or RAM. So these mobile devices attached to a computer, typically via a USB cable, though they can also be done wirelessly, and this kind of helps allow for synchronization of data back and forth. So let's talk about data acquisition. So depending on the warrant or the subpoena that you have, at the time that you're trying to collect the data, you may only be allowed to search for certain things, which that's pretty common, which is the same thing for computer forensics. The messages might be received on a mobile device after a seizure. Are you allowed to access that? Are you not? So again, you want to know the appropriate laws that may come with that. Isolate the device from incoming signals with one of the following. Typically airplane mode or a paint can? No. Typically you put it in some type of Faraday blocking area, evidence bag that's also able, or turn the device off. The drawback of using these isolated options is that the mobile device is put into roaming mode that does accelerate the battery drainage. SANS has a DFIR forensics recommendation 
and that is if the device is on and unlocked, isolate it from the network. Disable the lock screen, remove passcodes. If the device is on and locked, what you can do is very depending on the type of device. Uh, we just seen that with major lawsuits between the FBI and Apple as it related to the San Bernardino uh, terror, uh, gunman slash terrorist attack. If the device is off, attempting a physical static acquisition and turn the device on, that may also work. Check the areas in the forensics lab, for example, the internal memory, the SIM card, if there's additional memory cards, uh, maybe contact the ISP. If there's cloud storage or cloud syncing, that might be another option. Checking the network provider requires a search warrant or subpoena, that's understandable. There have been new complications that have surfaced because of backups that might be stored in the cloud, both by the carrier and or third parties. Example, iPhone that backs up a Verizon iPhone, for example. If you pay for the Verizon option, you have the ability to back up your phone to the Verizon cloud. Also, because it's an iPhone, you have the ability to back it up through iCloud. So there is some more complexity with that. Also with the form of encryption, assuming that you set it so that your backups are encrypted and or the phone is also encrypted. Due to the growing problem of mobile devices being stolen, several users started using this option called the remote wiping. That way, any sensitive information can be wiped. However, a downside to that is if you're doing illegal activities and an authority is able to get a hold of your phone, you may accident or you, the criminal, may be able to wipe your device when it's in the hands of the authorities. Memory storage on a mobile device is a combination of both volatile and non volatile. So, things that are, are in memory that will be lost if it's powered off and things that are not sort of memory that are more long-term storage, photos, videos, things like that. Also, random thing, file structure on a SIM card is very hierarchy. It's the traditional operating system. And you can see that here. Information that you can uh, retrieve from a mobile device normally falls in four categories, service related, call data, message, or location information. If power has been lost, pins or other access codes may be required to view those logs. For example, uh, after iOS 10 on an iPhone, they were very pro setting up passcodes and or fingerprint readers so that you have to have one of those to unlock that device. Mobile forensics is an evolving science. It's still growing, it's still maturing. Procedures for working on mobile forensic software is typically identify the mobile device. Make sure you have you installed the mobile device forensic software, attach the phone, start the forensic software, and download the information. Assuming that you're allowed to. Assuming you have the appropriate hardware to do so. SIM card readers, again, that may be a separate piece of hardware that will be used to read the SIM. It can be hardware or software, depending on your software requirements or your budget, I guess. You may need a forensic lab that with the appropriate anti-static options if you are messing with a SIM card so you don't accidentally destroy it. General procedure, pull out the SIM card, put the SIM card in the SIM card reader. Though there are a variety of uh, tools that are out there, so be careful. There are some Mac versions of tools out there, Mac Lockpick 3, for example. That's one version of mobile software. There's also the Access Data FTK Imager software. NIST also has a collection of mobile forensic methods. Manual extraction, logical, hex dumping, chip off, or micro reading. And that's a lot more in depth than what we're than what we need to go into. We actually go into this in detail in my mobile forensics course. 
there's plenty of software out there. It just kind of depends on what you have the licensing for and the experience with. FTK has a wide set of tools that we often use. SimCon is used to recover files on a GS or GSM or G3, 3G SIM card. And again, there are several features with that tool. Roughly half of Facebook users access their accounts typically via a mobile device, whether it be a tablet and or computer and or phone. So there are very specific procedures for logical acquisitions followed by a physical acquisition to help kind of yield better results. This is always my favorite, a Celebrate. It's often used by law enforcement and you can determine the device's make and model. You hook up the appropriate cable to our Celebrite and then that does it. However, there's so many apps and there's so much development on our phones that the Celebrite technology is not always the most current. There are tons of ways to do extractions with the appropriate tools. Mobile Forensics Tools, this is just again a simple report in action. Again, this is just more of a viewing. Many mobile forensics tools are available, though they're not free and they're pretty dang expensive. New technology uh, challenges, hypervisors for mobile devices are under development. VDI, that's accessible via a web page, is already out there. Wearable devices, an iWatch, for example, is already there. So mobile devices is not always as straightforward as one would think. And that's actually the end of chapter 12. We talked about a lot of information about mobile technologies, about um, mobile technologies uh, generations, 3G, 4G, uh, we talked about uh, data, we talked about PDAs, we talked about data acquisition, how to worry about data classification, SIM card reading, things of that nature. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.